Hi, welcome, friends. So we are proceeding with our auditing lecture. So um, just just one quick one. Um, auditing is 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 practical. Is is technical. Okay, it's a lovely area. On, on today, um, a couple of days ago, I was having a class with my final year students, um, and then I was trying to induce them, persuade them, okay, motivate them to get into the field of audit. Surprisingly, none of them were interested in getting into audit, and I was I was really sad. Okay, I was really sad. I don't know what happened to them with the auditing classes, but um, friends, auditing is a great area you should venture into. It gives you the confidence to to voice out your your technical competence. Okay, it exposes you to a number of opportunities. You can't count them. Just a lot, especially those of us. Who have chosen the part of accountancy auditing is great so before i start this lecture what i'm telling is that listen audit is a good area take it easy take it easy with the lectures with the slides don't think it's something you cannot do it is it may be technical yes but that is why you are special accounting is special go across the whole world and the only profession that is consistent across the globe. It's accounting. It's accounting. Okay. So you get it, you become chartered as an ACCA or ICAEW or a CPA. In the UK, you go to US and you technically say that is the same thing which has been done there. Okay. Names may be changed by the same procedure, the same financial basic traditional financial statements we have. If you talk of audit, um, you talk of medicine, for example, it's different. Go to Africa and you have tropical medicine. You come here, you don't find tropical medicine in the UK, you see. So you leave, you get, you get, you get your your medical certificate here in the UK. You go to Africa, you'll be asked to join or write their their medical exams or their medical bar, uh, professional exams. It's not like accounting. Okay. I'm proud to be an accountant. So I'll say audit is good. Venture into the field and you love it. All right. Okay, I'll split this section into two parts. We are dealing with audit planning, audit risk, and materiality. I'll split it in two parts. So that is what we're going to find. So up, up until some point, I'll cut it off and then we we'll continue with the rest in the next video. Okay. Once again, my video is, is a summary. Like I always say, it's a summary. I would really love that, friends. You would take the pains yourself to read the core text, okay? And the recommended text, the CCA text, okay? I'll tell you something at the end of this video, okay? I know it is a lot of work using the book. That book you are using, okay, is actually a, a blend of two ACCA books. The ACCA Auditing and Assurance, which you will usually be exempted from should you pass this paper. And then the ACCA Advanced Audit and Assurance is all embedded in this book, okay? It's all embedded in this book, okay? So what I would say is that uh, I know it is a lot of work. That is why some of the items I, I will quickly skip over because it's not something you'll be examined on for at this level. If I examine you on this and you're not exempted at a professional level, what's the sense in it, okay? So we just kick and, and look at what is important at your level, then we move on. All right. So audit risk and materiality, the, the lesson points are a lot. I'll quickly run through them. So I want to look at audit objectives, how we can meet them. Even if I don't talk about this, you already know this in the previous videos, okay? There are some specific phrases. Like I said, auditing accountancy is a technical area. It's a special area. So there are some specific phrases we will use. What does it mean in the context of an audit? Professional skepticism, I wouldn't hit on this now. I wouldn't come to this. I'll, I'll skip it for now because you already know when and how we should always apply um, that professional judgment in our audit procedures. Components of audit risk. In the previous videos, I've explained that components of audit risk, uh, audit risk is a function of three items, inherent risk, control risk, and then detection risk. But I'll come to that again. And then, what I want you to look at here is the materiality and performance materiality, okay? Take that core text, um, chapter 10, okay? Chapter 10 is what um, the whole of this covers. 
and then go into the audit um, materiality and the performance materiality. There are qualitative estimates, but usually we would want you to focus on the quantitative estimates. Okay, so how do I set the materiality? I will not, I will not go into this in the video. I expect you to go read it, just one and a half page or one page in the text, then you go and read it, okay? Page um, 138 to 139, you'll find it there, okay? So look at the performance materiality. ACC has a standard metric they have set, which almost every audit firm uses, okay? And, and so you'll find five to 10% of the pre-tax profits to be set as a performance materiality, 1% of revenue to be set as performance materiality, and then you also find 5% of net asset value. Okay, so these metrics are being used to set the materiality um, thresholds. Go into that, I will not, I will not delve into this. It's, it's yours to, to research into and to read about, okay? What factors will affect audit planning? We'll spend more time on audit planning, and then we understand client risk evaluation process, okay? Trying to understand the client is the ISA 315, okay? That's the reason why I love this book, okay? You don't even find it in the ACC text. This book gives you an appendix of major ISS, International Standards on Auditing, which you would want to get abreast and familiar with, okay? Um, we want to also see how we can document a client system as part of our audit process, flowcharts, questionnaires, internal control questionnaires, We'll further go into internal control questionnaires in subsequent chapters, okay? But we'll look at briefly flowcharts, the advantages and then disadvantages. And I'll explain, I'll, I'll, I'll give you more explanations on that. The audit strategies, three main, I will briefly touch on that. If I don't, you have to read on it. Okay, read, read the text. Then audit planning, audit planning process, we'll spend more time on this, analytical procedures, we will not touch or go deep into that because we've dealt with that in the previous um, video, but I, I'm going to touch on it in subsequent videos. So skip this one for now and then we'll proceed. But of course, there's something brief we'll show you on the analytical procedures, their limitations, how to be used. We'll give you that. Okay, we'll give you that. But um, we'll go further into it in subsequent videos. We've already seen how it works. Okay, timing of audit visits, then we will wrap up. Okay. So I kick off. So audit planning, ISA 300 gives us how we can plan an audit of financial statements. Okay, and it says that, listen, here, when we want to plan the audit of financial statements, as an auditor, you must set an, an overall strategy at the bigger picture level, okay? Um, so give another overall audit strategy. And then out of the strategy, you bring out the detailed elements, okay? So set the scope, the boundaries of the work. The timing, which period are you auditing? Are you reviewing, okay? And then of course, you chart out a pathway, a direction, which will guide you in developing your audit plan, which will guide you in executing your audit plan, which will help you to achieve your audit objectives, okay? So audit planning is very important, okay? Like I said, get a general strategy, drill down the specifics, okay? The extent of work you will do, the time and the nature of work you do, okay? And if there are any specific disclosures you want to work on, today, today you will find that in financial statements, we are having sustainability reporting metrics being populated in CSR, ESG um, reports, okay? So and as part of your audit planning, if there are these specific disclosures you will be reporting on, or it will be infused into your work, which you will sign off, you must prepare a plan for that, okay? I can't just give you ABCD to publish, or I have reviewed ABCD for you to, to publish, only for you to bring in MNO. I need to look at what you are bringing to, 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 to augment my report. At the end of the day, it is my name which goes out. Okay. So as part of these specific disclosures, look at examples that cited sustainability reports. If there are any, any audit procedures which will likely detect fraud, you must put down that, that one within your planning, okay? And then any, any validity of director's assumption about the going concern status or prospects of the company, specific disclosures. They will tell you that the company is going to be making this profit, it's going to be expanding into these territories. So they tell you these things. 
and they give you assumptions that in the wake of this energy crisis, we can still survive and we can still make a lot of profit. We sustain our customers. So these assumptions managements are making, you, you have to vouch it. You have to keep it in your plans so that you can vouch it, okay? Now, audit planning, it is always important for us to plan and finish the plan before we kick off the work, okay? But it is not static. Whilst on the job, if we see anything that is evolving, that is developing, that comes to light, amend the audit plan. Change it as you as you progress with the audit. So the audit plan is quite flexible and it can keep changing until the final date when you sign up the accounts, okay? It's not static. Now, again, why do we plan, okay? Why do we plan, reasons to plan? So that we can know areas which are risky, where we can devote much time. It helps us to also identify and resolve problems on a timely basis. I plan ahead. You may have heard of this caveat that if you fail to plan, you, you plan to fail, okay? So we want to uh, identify areas where we can quickly resolve these problems so that we don't, we are not tagged as failures, okay? Again, we plan so that we can organize and manage our audit engagement so that we can finish it in a timely manner and also be efficient and effective, achieve the objectives of the audit. When we plan the audit, it tells us that Richard can do revenue. Let's put him on the team. Revenue, not any other revenue, maybe revenue of the banks. Banking sector, he's good in that. Let's put him on the team. John can do uh, PPE because he's been the best person who, who works on PPE in, in almost any engagement. Let's put him on the team. So it helps us to select who should be on the audit team. And then the, the reviewers, the quality control reviewers, the engagement partners, the audit in charge, the supervisors, the audit managers, the plan helps them to direct the audit team on the right path if they are veering off track and also helps them to, to supervise the work, okay, to review the work which has been done. And finally, the list uh, we have provided here from the book, I have always told them it's not, as, it's not exhaustive, okay, but these are key ones we can see for planning. It helps to coordinate the work done by auditors, other auditors, other experts, bring all of them together in one pool, okay, to get a comprehensive picture of what you are planning to do. The audit process is, is quite elaborate, okay? That's why we try to leave it, um, the plan, we leave the plan to be, to be flexible. We leave the plan as flexible as we can to adjust, to amend as we move along. Now, it is always important as part of the planning process, we consider the background to the client's business. I sat 315. Okay, you try to understand the business, the nature of business, the environment in which you, it operates, which will help you to identify any areas of um, risk of material misstatements. Okay, we, we want to look at those areas. So also consider an outline plan for the audit. One, so you are planning the process of audit, an outline plan. Who does what? When do we start? How do we cut off? Okay, areas where we need to devote more time, okay? As part of the planning process, we must review previous year's files. Unless this is the, the first time audit and there's not been previous year's audit, that, that's a different case, okay? Any changes in legislation or accounting practice that may impact the, the financials you are going to audit, you have to look at it. For example, IAS, 30, IAS 17 deals with leases today. It has been superseded by what? IFRS 16, by the IFRS Foundation. So check the changes in the leases, okay? Two, two of two main um, standards which normally keep changing, revenue, revenue, leases, they keep changing, okay? So the question is, um, how, how have these changes in accounting practice or legislation or accounting standards affected or will affect the business? How, okay? Any management um, statements they've provided us, any interim financial statements, review them, okay? And then, of course, we must meet the senior management as part of the planning process. If there's anything you want to delve into further, you ask them to provide you explanations, okay? You, you, we always have the kickoff meetings where you, you meet them and they tell you something. But even before you go for the kickoff meeting, you must always meet the senior management ahead of time, have some discussions with them, get some documents or some assumptions, some understanding from them before you go to the field. 
Also consider the timing. When are we starting? When are we ending? Would we have one of intensive audit or would we split it into two, an interim audit and then a final audit? Okay. What work should the client staff do? Sometimes you need some shadows from them. So you have to give them ahead of time. Whilst you are doing your text review, that can you work on this payroll schedule and give it to us, pension schedule or investment schedules and send it to us. Okay. Who are going to be on the on the staff, on the on the audits, on the audit engagement? We've said that, okay. Planning helps us to know who will be on the on the on the on the on the team. Not everyone can be on a particular audit. Okay. Any possible problems with the audit team, let's discuss it. Okay. If it happens that in the past these guys did some poor job and almost landed us in trouble, discuss it before you go on to this second job. Prepare a budget. Almost all the audit fees which are being charged to the clients are based on the budget which is prepared by the audit firm. Because they will tell you that senior managements are coming, five senior managers or two senior managers, each of them, their hourly rate is 200 pounds. They will work 1,700 hours on the, on the job. They multiply it. So there's a budget which will go to the clients, a basis for which they charge the fees, okay? Liaise with the clients on dates. When are we coming to start? When are we going to do the inventory count? Okay, when are we going to do a petty cash count? Sometimes you do a surprise, especially for petty cash, you can do a surprise cash count, but dates like inventory count, you must agree on the dates, okay? You then prepare what we call the APM, audit planning memorandum. We'll come to that one. What does it include? Almost what we have said here, you'll find them again in the audit planning memo memorandum, okay? Now, the, the detailed planning procedures, like we said, before you start the audit, you must always have the strategy, the general strategy, okay? Then you have the detailed planning procedures which you include in the plan, okay? Now we should undertake, the auditor should undertake the following detailed planning, consider the terms of the engagement, when are we starting, when are we ending, when are we going for field visit, when are we doing the interim, okay, the dates, timelines, okay? If, for example, you are auditing, let's say, um, an oil firm or an oil refinery, Consider what is happening today in our world with the Ukraine-Russian war. How is it affecting the, the oil industry, the specific industry? How is it affecting the whole world, the whole economy or the country in which the company is based? Okay, So consider the general economic conditions and then the industry-specific conditions in which your, your clients operate. Okay, Once again, we said review previous year's audit file. Okay, which will give you a stepping stone on what you should be expecting or what you would have to be doing this year. Okay, uh, assess the effects of changes. Okay, any changes uh, on the business operations, their strategies, their financial performance over the period last year, this year, you will surely have an interim financial statement for this year. So you can do some simple analytical reviews, some horizontal analysis and vertical analysis to check their financial performance, consider their invest, investor base ratios, okay, the EPS, the PE ratios, okay, the dividend yields and so on and so forth. Um, consider any reporting requirements. Are we just auditing these guys because they need to report in line with the IFRS or does the Companies Act 206, 2006 apply to them? Is there anything else, country-specific gaps they need to conform to? What is the management? Who are the managers? Who are the directors of the company? How is the operating style? Okay. Are there any public backlash against this company for, for, for areas or for some activities they might have done in the past? Okay. Consider all of this in the detailed planning process. It requires that as an auditor, you read more. I remember when I, remember when I, I qualified my ACCO back. 12 years ago, I don't know. And then they told us that, listen, as much as you think you might have read a lot and finished your ACCA, this is the time when you have to read more. Don't think you are finished, so you will not read. You have to read more. So always, as an auditor, you must read more. And especially on the field, you must read more. Okay. Because at the end of the day, that will give you the hints of where you should focus attention. 
Now, as part of the audit planning process, consider the impact, I've said this, on any changes in legislation, accounting practices that would affect the entity, okay? Now, as an auditor, what is your cumulative knowledge of the accounting and internal control systems of the company and any changes in accounting procedures, okay? Both in the specific industry and on the entity which you are going to be auditing. So, um, ISA 315 comes in handy comes in very, very handy. You may be working with antenna auditors or other specialists. Consider the extent to which you rely on their work or the need to which you, the extent to which you will involve them in the work. I leave you on materiality levels preliminary. We always have a bigger materiality threshold you will set for the accounts balances level, okay, the, the bigger pictures, okay. So, and again, we have the transaction performance specific levels, okay transaction materiality thresholds which you need to set okay what am i saying let me take a little time to explain this okay time is running don't worry so if i look at current assets you know the big the figures are big so overall you look at current asset account captions the headings and you know the balances will be significant the question is you will be doing some analysis and calculations and trying to see that at this level if you realize that current assets has been under, overstated or understated by plus minus 2% or 1% is acceptable. But if it goes above that, it is not acceptable. That will be one level of materiality threshold you need to set. But within the PPE, okay, the, within the, the non-current assets, there will be PPE. Within the PP, you will want to check how many additions were added to, to plants, uh, to, to, to vehicles, okay, to, to furniture. Okay, how many? Uh, what, is, what is the depreciation amount which is calculated? At a transaction level, again, you must set a tolerable rate. At which level you will say that plus minus 5 or 10% materiality um, threshold level, we should accept it or we should not accept it. We should call for adjustments to be passed okay so materiality level would be at both the bigger picture level okay and then at the transaction specific level and move on so we now determine the audit approach okay what are you going to be doing would it be just a mix of would it be just substantive testing in depth or would it be a mix of control testing okay with substantive testing with analytical reviews with with observations, with, with inspections, okay? And, and that should help you to draft your audit program. For the audit program, what I would say is it is that most audit firms have a predefined, in-depth, detailed audit program. You only have to adjust it, okay? Once again, um, we said as part of our planning, look at who will be on the team, their expertise, their skills, their requirements, okay? Audit visit, you want to go to stock count, plan the time, okay? We prepare estimate and fee estimate, and then we prepare the formal APM. What is the APM, like I said? So typically, it will look at the background of the company you're going to audit, the environment in which you operate, their management, their management style, okay? Um, and normally, you find the APM appearing on your permanent file, okay? And then you also look at the outline scope of, um, audit scope of all the major profits and laws and balance sheet headings, okay? Uh, today you will not hear profit and loss, but you still hear statement of profit or loss, okay, or statement of financial position. But it's the same thing. You know this, okay? So you're looking at this outline of this, the major headings, looking at what, what, what is to be done in these areas as part of your planning. Why should we do it? How should we do it? When would we do it? Okay, consider all the elements you can think of within these particular headings. The timing and reporting requirements. Who requires our reports? When should we issue these reports? What should be included in these reports? The APM will tell us, okay. The timing of critical phases of the audit, we'll look at this one, okay. We'll look at the critical phases. So I'll show you a, 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 a flow chart. Should I say a flow chart, a pictorial representation of the various phases, okay. Then again, you want to look at Proposed liaison with the internal audit firm or internal audit staff, okay? Whether they are right-sourced to augment the internal folks 
or totally outsourced or they are totally in-house. I mean, you, you look at how to the extent, extent to which you liaise with them, okay? Any staff requirements, um, timing budget, all goes in here. As part of our audit planning, we need to look at some tools that we use. Basically, the main tools will be the flowcharts and then ICQs, okay, internal control questionnaires, okay? There are techniques we can also use as well. We'll look at one or two of the techniques, okay? So what are the um, flowcharts? We know what flowcharts are, friends. You know what a flowchart is, okay? So it's typically showing us a pictorial representation of the client system using standardized what? Symbols, starting from here, ending from here. So you see a, 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 a triangle, and the triangle tells you the process has started. You see a triangle, and it tells you the process has ended. You see as an oval, and it tells you that this is the approval level. You see um, a rectangle, it tells you that this is the payment level. Okay, so when you take the text, okay, I have also populated a, an appendix at the end of this slide. Okay, it may not be too visible, but you, you should have time to look at it. You will see it. Okay, that the, the book gives a very good picture of that. I tried to fix it in there, you should find it, okay? So it shows, it documents the flow of activities from one state to the other. I'll give you an example. Um, let's say procurement, the accounting department <clears throat> wants to procure laptops for their staff, okay? You don't just get up as an accounting department because you think you control the funds and then just call or put the order on Amazon and buy the items. No, no, you don't do that. So you realize that maybe the, there's somebody in charge for, for purchasing in the accounting department or somebody in charge of making raising requisitions. requisitions. Maybe the executive, um, the assistant accountant, let me put it that way. So you raise the requisition, okay, a document. Then this one, this document goes to the CFO, who will then review and, and review it in line with the approved budget for the year and authorize it. This document then goes to the purchasing department. The purchasing department will also reconcile this with the budget possibly, and then they will raise, um, they'll call for quotations from vendors. So they'll also issue another document. The document goes to these vendors, they bring in quotations. A different set of documents are also brought. So you see the requisition is there, the purchase department raises another document. They put it on top of the requisition or underneath the requisition. And then, then the quotations come. They attach it. So they review the quotation. They give it to the procurement committee. They will sit behind this document, validate it, choose the best vendor, and then they approve. They minute it. That minuted document also is attached. Okay. Then the documents, the entire package now flows out to maybe the, the purchase department who would then um, ask the vendor to bring in the items. Items are brought in together with a way bill or goods received note. It doesn't go to the procurement, it goes to the stores receipt person. So the stores person will also take it. We'll try to reconcile the order which has been received against whatever requisition which was raised. Files that document. So the document then flows one after the other. Afterwards, goods have been received the vendor then issues an invoice. A document comes in again. Then the entire package now moves to the purchase and um, to the payment section. Okay. Then the payment section will now reconcile the order, the invoice, and then the the, the requisition, whatever it is. Then they, they jammed it up. Then it goes to maybe a different authority or maybe the CFO again or someone with a different oversight who will then reconcile all of this before payments is made. So Realize that before you take that stack of paper, okay, that stack of paper, which has that procurement um, details of purchasing five laptops for the accounts department, the document would have flown from one stage to the other. Listen, sometimes it can be complicated, not just as easily as I have stated. If it is computer you want to buy, IT department may even have to come in to vouch and see whether the specifications of the computers you are buying conform with the universe, uh, with the company standards or company's requirements, okay? Uh, it meets their protocol, so it can be complicated sometimes, all right? So it is easy to see the flow of documents from one state to the other, one advantage and relatively straightforward to update, okay? 
But like I said, the disadvantage is that it can be complex to draw the flow chart. And it needs to be supported by narratives and notes. Otherwise, sometimes you cannot make meaning from it, all right? The ICQs will have a good time looking at example of ICQs. They are simply questionnaires, quite um, straightforward, um, closed-ended, not open-ended. Sometimes we want to make it open-ended to get more information, but usually you find them quite straightforward. We want to get information about your system, which will help us to audit, our, do our audit work. Okay, so they are used to record um, the client system, ascertain their system, and you see them asking who approves payments for, for requisitions, who keys in new additions of staff into the system, okay? So you see questions like what, how, when, type of questions, and they're quite descriptive. They are actually like an addition. They augment and supplement the flow charts and narratives. Okay, they give narratives. So it helps us to better understand the system and know areas which could have possible weaknesses, okay, or um, system failures for which we can then focus our attention. One technique auditors would use usually, um, it happens on the field of work, okay, once they've done their their audit planning and they go on to the field is to undertake what we call walkthrough test. They pick a few number of transactions, two, three, okay? And then the, comp the client has told you that the, the person, there's a requisitor who, re who required, who raised a requisition to purchase laptops. It goes to the purchase department who will then review it. They will now call for bids or tenders from, from vendors. When the bids are in, they send it to the purchase uh, procurement committee who will review and then approve. And then they, they, they attach their minutes of approval or sanctioning. Then who will then go out, raise the order. It goes to the warehouse. Once orders have been received, they reconcile the GDN, goods delivery notes or GRN, goods receipt notes to whatever has been ordered, so on and so forth, like I explained earlier. So the walkthrough test is that pick that stack that bulk of documentations, pick an example, and then walk through each stage of the process to see whether the controls they have stated, they have explained to you actually works. Okay, so that's what we mean like, like walk through test. So you pick a transaction and then you want to trace it from origination through to completion. That's it, okay. So th that is work through test, and it is always important for you to do that. You know that is why most clients, most uh, um, audit um, clients, want to hire the auditor because the auditor understands the system. See, the auditor has a bigger picture of how the the transaction is originated from scratch to the end. Okay, maybe this video will go for three three different parts because I'm looking at my time. I can see we almost 30 minutes pass. Okay. So walkthrough tests are very important. Any auditor who is who is good on the job and that takes walkthrough tests. At KPMG, it was required of us as part of our audit program to always undertake the walkthrough test. Okay. I'm going to end here in the next two, three slides. Then we do the next session. Okay. So like I said, ICQs um, would normally form part of the permanent file. This walkthrough test and other work related to current audit will be on the on the current file. Okay, so I'm gonna end here. Let me move one step and see. Okay, good. Um, critical steps. I will leave it here. So the next thing we are going to do is that we look at the timing of critical phases of the audit. Okay, the critical phases of the audit. All right. Then we shall see what next we can do. Okay, friends, I'll see you in the next bit on still on audit planning, audit risk and materiality. All right, bye for now.